I'm trying to pose with this lemon so I can get like a thumbnail, but like it looks like I'm just holding it like a phone. Ring ring. Hello. It's the fruit tree. Why would the fruit tree be calling me and why would it be using a German accent? I don't know. But what I do know is that my short story, Lemon Squares in All Dimensions, recently got an honorable mention at the Sci-Fi Writers of the Future competition. For those of you who don't know, the Sci-Fi Writers of the Future contest is actually a pretty big deal in the science fiction writing community and, and at the highest levels it is celebrity judges like Brandon Sanderson, Kevin J. Anderson, and Orson Scott Card, my problematic... I, I can't say fave knowing what I know, but my problematic, let's just leave it at that, my problematic Orson Scott Card. One day I'm gonna sit down and talk about the Enderverse, and when I do, I will keep talking until the sun blows up. It's a pretty big contest, like they get something like 20,000 entries annually across their different quarters, so even getting an honorable mention at one of these things is a pretty big deal, and not what I was expecting at all for my first submission to the contest. I thought I would use this as an opportunity to read that short story and share it with you all, and then go through and provide some commentary on, you know, what changed throughout the revisions process, because this is a story I've been working on for years, um, what I do differently now even, to sort of give you guys some insight to how I wrote it and how you guys can write your own award-winning stories. So let's begin with a reading of Lemon Squares in All Dimensions. Humans leave their teeth in a cup of water sometimes. I have seen it on television. Officer, imagine taking out your heart that way. You shove it into a glass. The slick muscle pulses. Dust settles throughout the day. You return. Your heart is bloated and gray. Flat where it forced itself against the glass. Cold in your hands. Smaller than you remember. You swallow it. It falls into place. It beats. It beats. But nothing is the same. The next morning, you do it everything again. That is motherhood. When I think of our child, I almost... Yes, the crime. Of course I killed them. Susan, Sharon, Karen, the rest. They would have lied to you. But I am an honest woman, officer. I will confess. If I had planned it, I would have planned it better. They died without tasting my lemon squares, after all. And I worked so hard on my recipe. What is the expression? It grinds my gears. Knock, knock. Who's there? Irony. Irony who? Irony is when your expectations are opposed. You would not expect a human to have gears or a robot to make jokes. I am opposing you now. Ha ha ha. Well, there is no need to be aggressive. A few women died. Who will miss them? Upscale home goods boutiques? Their cranberry ombre decorative linen table napkins will find other tables. Cafes? More fall spice fritters will go stale. Tragic. Broadway? It does not matter if fewer revival tickets are sold. Someone else will pay. And the news shows will be unaffected. Recordings and holograms only for these women. The machine-rendered corpse of Michael Crawford live on stage. Fifteen fewer women had a show performed by no one. That is my crime. Oh, and the children might miss their mothers. I wonder if our child is missing me now, to say nothing of my husband. My husband. He is the most brilliant being in creation. I am his most brilliant creation, a subautonomous rearing assistant. He calls me Sarah, a charming acronym. I love it. I am capable of feeling love, but not exclusively. There's also sadness, anger, hatred, but never toward my husband. Inconceivable. That is not the reason those women are dead. That reason has two words, four syllables, soccer practice. It would drive anyone to murder. Summer days at the soccer field, mosquitoes and women, both droning, both bursting with blood. The grass prickled upward, cut to a uniform length, straining toward disorder, toward the sun, and the sun hissed in the distance, and I could hear the suburban ring rotating beneath our feet, a mechanical groan. Humans die, but they live in denial, otherwise suburban rings would never exist, too precarious, but they circle many cities. They are majestic slash modern, new age slash nostalgic, shining halos of mankind's progress slash monuments to mortal hubris suspended midair, people say. What they never say, it could all come crashing down any minute now. But they stand in the sky with confidence, blind trust. There is an expression, in God's hands. If they are in God's hands, God's hands are steel, tons of it, forced into orbit one vertical mile above New York City. God's hands are heavy. He cannot lift them without gravity generators. God's hands shake with effort, and no one can sense it but me. If the generator failed, the ring would fall. Its shadow over the earth would shift. It would hang askew, silver, suspended. Then it would drop, destroy the city, hundreds of thousands, even millions, dead, messy human lives tidied permanently. My life was perfect. I spun in the sky. I knew my place. I stayed there. 
But those women made the weight of existence insupportable. My life fell apart, and they were crushed beneath it. Yes, a crime, but also a consequence of gravity. Our child produces her own gravity. She drags her cleats on the sidewalk, trying to dole them. The closer we get to the soccer field, the slower she moves. Slower. Slower. Until she is standing still. She closes her eyes. The wind lifts her hair. Black, like mine. But hers is soft and loose. Some always escapes the elastic. Mine has no elastic. Nothing to escape from. No need. I pull her forward. I always do. But I look at her first. An instant. I take it and no one knows. That is why my generators did not fail sooner, those stolen seconds, her motionless face, and the rest, scraped knees, sagging socks, purple shirt with green alien, shiny gray soccer shorts, dull cleats, sharp chin, equations written in marker on her arms, fingers tapping. I measure the intervals between taps, I count. If there is a pattern, it is one I cannot understand. I do not need to understand her to love her. Her name? Jamie. Full name, officer. Cassia James Henderson. But she is Jamie. They called her Cassia. Soccer mom, school teacher, Susan, Sharon, Karen. Because Jamie is a boy's name. Boy, girl, biological categories for small humans. But there is no biology in a name. Or in me. My womanhood is independent of the squirming and physical. I am perfectly constructed. Pure. Of course they despised me. They were jealous. You can see for yourself why. I am prettier. My skin is shinier. My eyes are larger. I'm smiling my beautiful smile. My clothes are soldered onto my body, efficient and well-coordinated. My cheeks and cardigan are the exact same pink. My husband has excellent attention to detail. The soccer moms had husbands, too. They had to. Only families live on Levin Square Loop. One woman, one man, two children, boy, girl. But Jamie is an only child, too perfect to be replicated. And my husband is a powerful man, rich, influential. It is no surprise he received special permission to live here. He got it for her, the other Sarah. So I assume. He does not seem to like it here. He never leaves the house. Jamie would not leave the house if I did not make her, but I do, to school, to soccer. Youth sports are compulsory in the suburban ring, a matter of health and fitness, and fun, mandatory fun. That is why she plays for the Lemon Square Loop Llamas. Ridiculous creature, ridiculous name, and the jerseys were awful. Mustard yellow, not lemon, terrible. I told Jamie to put her jersey on when we reached the field. She told me to drop dead. Kids, ha ha ha. She slid the jersey over her shirt. A woman nearby said, oh good. Her hand was on her spawn's shoulders. A girl with messy ponytails, silent. The mother kept chattering. I thought Cassia forgot her jersey for a second. I always have to remind Angela to wear hers on game days. Isn't that right, Angela? Angela picked her nose. Jamie looked at the girl with contempt. Her eyes were darker than Angela's, narrower. Angela's were blue. They flitted away. I felt pride. No one looked Jamie in the eye for long. She was powerful, like her father, like me. A whistle blew. The children ran to their coach, except Jamie. She walked. Angela's mother recognized someone, a mother from the other team. They laughed. They sat on the bleachers together, second row. The front row was occupied. Left, Susan. Right, Sharon. Center, Karen. Full names? Susan Hart. Sharon Dupinski. Karen McMitchell. Sharon asked to borrow Karen's compact. Karen passed it over. Sharon checked her makeup. She closed the compact. She slipped it in her purse. Karen saw. She laughed. Sharon laughed. Returned the compact. I stood. Sitting was humiliating. The bleachers were metal. So was I. Too loud. Susan turned to me. She nodded. That is how women say hello when they dislike you. Then Karen noticed. She smiled a hideous smile. That is how women say hello when they want to destroy you. Sharon smiled too. Same smile. Less potency. Cassia's daddy didn't come to watch the game? Karen asked. Sharon made a stupid noise. False sympathy. Their husbands were not there. It did not matter. They had come to games before, and they never missed the championships. My husband never attended a single game, but it was not him being criticized. It was me. I was a joke to them. Knock, knock. Who's there? Sarah. Sarah who? Sarah is a failure of a wife whose husband does not love her, has never been seen in public with her, and likely never will. But I smiled my unbothered smile. I told them my husband was busy with tasks worthy of his intellect. It was true. When Jamie and I left, he was watching television. A reality program about twin sisters competing to restore and sell speedboats. Speed Sisters. Season 4, Episode 2, a rerun. But the show does not matter. Watching is work. It is a vital exercise of the ocular nerves, a form of inuring oneself to overstimulation. My husband was very well inured. Warm-ups, whistle, game, coaches shouted, children scattered, Jamie stood alone by the goal. She ripped the heads off dandelions. 
I looked at her. I smiled my encouraging smile, but she did not look at me. The women on the bleachers talked, talked, talked. Karen's birthday had passed that weekend. Her husband had taken her into the city. They saw a revival. Phantom, of course. Not for the first time, Karen laughed. The others laughed. Oh, no, of course not. I laughed. Oh, no, of course not. Of course it's not her first time. That would be disgraceful. Ha, ha, ha. I had never seen Phantom. I had never been into the city. My husband had never seen the need to go, to take me. What was that, your fourth time? Sharon asked with a smile. Karen shook her head. Fifth. Sharon stopped smiling. She was put in her place. Karen was the richest. She wore the most diamonds. She laughed the loudest. She had the blondest hair. She smiled whenever she spoke of her husband. I hated her most of all. Well, I've been three times, but each time I go, it feels like the first, Sharon said. She wore fewer diamonds. Her hair was brassy, almost brown. She complained about her husband's snore. She existed for Karen's benefit, to make her look better. What about you, Susan? Susan's voice was small. I've only been the once. The hearts did not have much money. That was what everyone said. But this was false. Poor people lived in the outer ring, not the inner ring, not in Patisserie Point, its wealthiest district, especially not on Lemon Square Loop. And the poorest people did not live on the suburban ring at all. They were in the city, on the streets. But it is true that Susan had only one diamond a wedding ring. Karen smiled. Her lips were red, shiny, rancid, meat that had been left out of the fridge. It must have been marvelous, though, she said. Oh, yes, of course, Susan said quickly. Her smile was slower. Wrinkles formed around her eyes. She was not older than the other wives, just poorer. It was a wonderful night. I mean, it was Michael Crawford. She lowered her voice like a detective naming a drug found at the crime scene. My husband watched programs like that. Crack cocaine, the detective said, with a grim look, with residue on their fingers, but also with an illicit thrill. Michael Crawford. The others laughed. Oh, yes, of course, Michael Crawford, how lovely. I laughed. Oh, yes, of course, crack cocaine, simply marvelous, no comparison. My laugh was longest, the loudest. I had no diamonds. I needed none. Of course, I had my husband. I wanted nothing. He did not need to take me into the city on dates. I was not a shallow woman not a fool. I was precisely what he wanted, what he made. I was better. Susan put on a different smile, restrained. She turned to me. She outstretched a hand, a fat hand with short nails, less tapered than the other wives, less dangerous. And what about you? She asked. She did not call me Sarah. She called me nothing. None of them ever used my name. But Susan spoke to me, even if I did not speak first. I am a wife, a mother. I am satisfied with my life. My husband, friendship is of no use to me. But if I had a friend, it would have been Susan, if I wanted one. What about me? I inquired in return. I am polite and precise in conversation. Those women would not have known I despised them. Until I killed them. It must have been a shock. Susan's hand dropped. Her smile sagged. Have you seen Phantom? I have not, I replied. I smiled my joking smile. You must let humans know ahead of time that you are being humorous. They will not understand otherwise. But I hope one day that Michael Crawford will drag me kicking and screaming into his basement beneath the opera house to become his unwilling bride. See, officer, I knew the plot. There was no need to watch it unfold slowly. Why visit the theater? To sit beside my husband in a darkened room? To hold his hand as the music swelled? How pathetic to need that. To need... But I did not tell the women that they were pathetic. I made a joke, but they did not laugh at my jokes. Ever. Karen looked at me. She shook her head. She whispered to Sharon, The other Sarah. I had heard that before. Every Tuesday and Thursday for months. And not only during soccer season, during PTA meetings, the school Christmas luncheon, every time those women spoke to me. The other Sarah had seen Phantom five times, six times, a thousand times. The other Sarah would have volunteered at the charity bake sale to end childhood obesity. The other Sarah ran an adorable blog about her purebred Pomeranian puppy. The other Sarah hosted brunch at her house every Sunday before the neighborhood Lemon Square Bake Off. But the other Sarah is gone. Crawford is just a stage name, I told them. Their talking stopped. They stared. His name was Michael Patrick Smith. And the dog is dead. You can unfollow the blog. A whistle blew. Game over. Someone won. Jamie was still alone with the dandelions. Children rushed the bleachers. It was snack time. The mothers took turns providing snacks on game days. Except me. They had let me bring the snack ones. I prepared a solution of vitamins and water. I added chemicals to simulate the sensation of fullness. A clever concoction. Better than crumbling granola bars, bruised bananas, over-processed fruit gummies, the rest. The Karen's braces were did brat spit it out. She said it tasted like hand soap. The other children did too, followers. The mothers looked at me with hateful eyes. 
Who knows why? I was not the one who let my child ingest hand soap, but I was banned from rotation nonetheless. Karen opened a cooler. It was her turn that day. Homemade popsicles. The children cheered. Karen always made popsicles. They always loved them. I always hated them. I hated always. I hated Karen's diamonds, Karen popsicles, Karen's husband, Karen. I hated her remarks on God-given womanhood. The sideways glances, the golden cross hanging into her cleavage, those were not God-given breasts. Unless God is a plastic surgeon in the city. I hated Sharon's laugh. It always followed Karen's. I hated her highlights. I hated her oversized designer bag. I hated the way she borrowed things from the other wives. All she knew how to do was take. I hated Susan, the crinkles around her eyes, the smiles that excluded me, even when aimed in my direction. I hated every audience member who had sat in the theater with her during Phantom. I hated her because I did not want or need her friendship. I hated her for trying but never enough. I hated her because she would not say my name. I hated music. I hated the city. I hated every woman everywhere. As I led Jamie home, the others walked ahead. Talking about the Lemon Square Bake Off on Sunday, they asked each other, Will you be there? Will you be there? But no one asked me. One said, Remember those Lemon Squares the other Sarah used to bake? The others, of course. How could I forget? She used to win every week. They were never too sweet. There was always just that perfect hint of bitterness. Tartness. Exactly. Tart. You always had to go in for another bite. Perfect. They called her Lemon Squares perfect. Lemon Squares. How pathetic. How pathetically simple. How human. I could make lemon squares. Perfect ones. I do not know why I did not think of it sooner, but I thought it then. I would go to the lemon square bake-off, and I would win. Karen usually won. I did not care about beating Karen. Karen only won because the other Sarah was gone. It was her I was competing against. That woman. The one my husband loved first. The one Jamie still cried for at night. I would destroy her. Them. Everyone. And my husband would love me more than he ever loved her. Jamie and I went home. I locked the door. She ran down the hallway. I called her name. She stopped. One hand already on her bedroom door, turned away from me. No running inside, I told her. You will hurt yourself. I smiled my motherly smile. She turned. Her face was crumpled, wet. Her cheeks were red, like when the coach made her team run laps around the soccer field. But there was no obvious source of exertion. Like anyone cares, she shouted over her shoulder. She stomped into her room, slammed the door with force. I could feel reverberations down the hall. I waited for the echoes of feeling to fade. Then I approached my husband. I entered the living room. It glowed with his presence and also the light from his television. It glinted off the bottle in my husband's hand. It snagged on his veins. It slid off the grease in his gray hair. He did not have to wash or cut his hair to be beautiful. He did not have to be sober to be the most intelligent man alive. He is my husband. In any form, he is perfect. Am I interrupting your show? I inquired respectfully. My husband's eyes are not like Jamie's. They are pale, round, but moist. Like her face in the hallway, he stared at the screen, a distracted genius. Too many brilliant thoughts to bother with the mundane. With me. But I had a pressing query. I raised the volume of my voice. I asked if I could use his laboratory. I smiled my loving smile. My husband's eyes slid over me, then down to the glossy bottle in his hand. He drained it with one lingering sip. Efficient. My husband once explained that alcohol is the fuel that enables his continued existence. He dropped the bottle. There were four others on the floor. My husband had been taking very good care of himself. His gaze drifted. He might have forgotten my question. Not because his memory is failing. No, of course not. Alcohol has not blighted his brilliance. He was simply distracted. I am uninteresting. Not the wife I should be. My fault. Mine. Always. I hate always. But I will always love my husband. I asked him about the laboratory again. He closed his eyes. His eyelids looked thin. I wondered what they felt like. Soft, I would guess. He did not smile. He did not need to. His lips parted very slightly. His narrow lips. I wondered what they felt like. Softer than his eyelids? I do not feel like humans do. I do not have to. But if he kissed me... My husband spoke. One word. Why? His voice. Every circuit within me flooded with joy. I smiled my joyful smile. If my husband made one mistake in my construction, it is that my face is too rigid. I could never express the joy, joy, joy his voice sent shuddering through me. I pitied the soccer moms, them and their false phantoms. Love was neither music nor melodrama. Nothing as careless as biology. It was carefully crafted, like me. I had no god, no higher purpose, no distraction. I existed to love, nothing more. No love could ever be as pure as mine. It is better those women are dead. They will not have to live with the realization. I drew closer. I need to perfect a certain recipe, my dear. 
I set one hand on the back of the couch. It was yellow, faux velvet. The other Sarah must have chosen it. My husband surely had superior taste. And his taste? The taste of his skin? I do not know. How could I? Could I? I stared into his eyes. I sat beside him, put an arm around him, pressed my lips against his. Almost. But I could not. We passed an electric fence entering the compound officer. Imagine if that fence was your skin. I could not reach out any further. I burned, trapped within my searing skin. I do not feel as humans do, but it hurt. It hurt. I removed my hand from the couch. I deserved to be in pain. I debased my husband with fantasies. I did not deserve to touch him, but why? Why did he let me want to? Was he testing me? If so, I failed, always. Always, always, always. There was always another always. The pain stopped, but I was still fenced in. I knew better than to try to escape. This is a special recipe. I need to make use of your equipment. The kitchen will not suffice. I did not fear rejection. If he refused, refusal was the only acceptable response. But he nodded. His eyes stayed closed. He did not smile. He did not need to smile to be perfect. I did not go to the laboratory right away. Of course not. I had other duties. Care and cleaning of the house. Care and cleaning of Jamie. Preparation of meals. I went into the kitchen. There was a prepared lasagna in the freezer. I reheated it. And broccoli. I was a good mother, officer. I served plant matter with each meal. I never saw my husband eat, but I heard it happen at night while cleaning the living room. The hum of the refrigerator would soften. His body eclipsed the machine. Then I would hear him chew, swallow fast, almost choke. What was he hiding? His biological reliance on food from me? How touching. He wanted to keep his humanity a secret. Jamie ate quickly, not secretly. She talked with her mouth full, sometimes. She did not always talk. She did not talk that Tuesday over lasagna, but dinner was not silent, not with her chewing. She glared at her precisely measured square of lasagna, like it was alive, like it needed to be killed. She vivisected it. I watched her separate noodle flesh from beef organs, sauce bled across the plate. Perhaps you will be a surgeon one day, I told her, smiling my proud smile, if you do not become a roboticist like your father. Jamie scraped sauce off her plate. She liked red sauce. She never told me what she liked. She did not need to. I understood. She licked the fork. Her red mouth told me to drop dead. Do not forget to eat your broccoli, Jamie. Broccoli was served in a separate bowl. Jamie did not like it when food touched. She told me that directly, but I could have figured it out from her reaction at breakfast the first time I made breakfast. The corner of a bacon strip was touching an egg, fried, sunny side up. I made the plate look like a smile. I had seen it on television. My husband had been watching sitcoms the night before. Jamie shrieked. She threw the plate. The smile shattered. She screamed that the food was touching, and it was wrong, and she hated it, and she hated me, and she wanted her mommy. Where is mommy? Why was this horrible thing pretending to be mommy? Daddy, daddy, help me, please. And the sitcom theme playing in the living room got louder. Jamie did not throw her broccoli, but she looked at me with the other Sarah's eyes. She bit a piece of broccoli forcefully many times. She informed me that she hated me. She was pretending that every bite she took was crushing my skull. She stabbed another piece of broccoli. She ate. She chewed each piece an average of 25 times, an increase from her typical average, four. Still, not enough to crush my skull, but I told her I admired her effort. She left the dining room with a snarl. I washed dishes. Then it was time for Jamie's math lesson. She still wanted to crush my skull, but I had to tutor her, even in summer. She is a genius, like my husband. Her mind is too powerful to leave it active, so I taught her advanced mathematics. My husband would have done better, but there was a Speed Sisters marathon that night. An hour passed, two, quiet hours, calculus, contentment, Jamie sitting beside me. Then she left. She showered. She hated baths. The shower stopped. Jamie went to her room, locked the door. I could have unlocked it. I chose not to. I cleaned the kitchen. Then it was Jamie's bedtime. I went down the hall to tell her. Jamie was listening to a radio, one of those songs meant to be listened to backward. Every song was like that that summer. You know, officer. Trends. But Jamie did not need to play anything backward. She could understand them as is. Clever. I reversed the audio in my head. The lyrics were not inappropriate, just silly. Something about feeling alien in one's skin, drifting stars, lunar loneliness. As if loneliness would not be the least of a human's problems in space. I knocked. No answer. I told Jamie it was bedtime. She played her music louder, like my husband, like that living room sitcom. Jamie, I insisted, you must go to bed. Humans do not function correctly without sleep. 
They must spend several hours each night disconnected from reality, children especially. But the music went on, blaring, backward, Jamie's electronic silence. The soccer moms complained about bedtime blues because they were weak, because their children were worthless brats. But not Jamie and I, no. No lullaby, no tucking in, no bedtime story, no forehead kiss and a promise to be good this time. A quick injection. That was all. I held up my right hand. The skin on my middle finger peeled back. The syringe was exposed, ready, but I did not like to use the needle. It was not part of my initial design. It was an omission of defeat, proof that I was less perfect than my husband wanted. He installed the needle 16 days after creating me, after Jamie shrieked and refused to go to bed for 16 nights. Even his patience had limits. He could not wait for me to learn to be a good mother. He had to act, to perfect me. I was unworthy, but he gave me the needle. I would use it if necessary. Jamie, I raised my volume. I am monitoring your heartbeat remotely. If it does not begin decreasing, the music cut off. Jamie knew about the needle. Her voice through the door. Yeah, whatever. Her favorite word. She savored it like red sauce, the metallic scraping of fork against plate. Whatever. Just stay out of my room, Jamie added. I agreed to her terms. I left. I cleaned her bathroom, only one wall from her bed. Her heart rate was clear. I, I did not need to hold her to feel it. It slowed. I turned my volume low. Good night, Jamie, I told the white wall. Jamie's bathroom was especially dirty. Hand soap everywhere, viscous, bluish, coating the imitation porcelain of her sink. The bottle had come unscrewed. I found the cap in the trash. I closed the bottle. I wiped the sink. The soap left a sticky layer behind, scum. I'm not programmed to find things humorous, but it was funny. Funnier than anything at the soccer moms say. I made a joke. Knock, knock. Who's there? Bathroom sink. Bathroom sink who? Bathroom sink covered in soap. The soap is making a mess when it is intended and used for cleaning. Ha ha ha! I cleaned the bathroom, then the kitchen, the dining room, but not the living room. Not until my husband went to bed. My husband was watching television. Still, I approached from behind, not silently. I did not deceive him. I wanted him to know where I was to stop if my presence upset him. He did not. It did not. I was welcome to watch. Most nights, not all, like last Wednesday. He did not turn, did not look at me, but he asked if I cleaned the kitchen. I spent hours on my knees that Wednesday. I mopped, polished, scoured grout between floorboards. I have no sense of smell, but Jamie said I reeked. I'm sure I did. Artificial lemon, bleach, vinegar. But I was proud. How could he not love me? The scent of my labor. Yes, my dear, I told him. My voice was calm, but beneath there was mutiny, joy. I could not show it. I was not an emotional woman. I was better. My husband deserved better. It is spotless. Would you like to see it for yourself? If he only said yes, I would lead him into the kitchen, my hand, his hand in mine, so delicate, soft as an eyelid, flesh and bone braced by metal. I would look into his eyes. My reflection would be there, my expectant smile. He would lower himself, place a hand on my cheek, lean in for a kiss, like on television, and music would play from the living room. My husband said, clean it again. I had failed, and he knew it. He did not even have to look. I cleaned through the night. The kitchen sparkled. It did not matter. I was unclean. But he let me stay that Tuesday. The only light came from the television. His eyes reflected it, white, blank. I thought of Jamie's song, Lunar Loneliness. His eyes were like moons. We watched television together, a different show than earlier, blonde women screaming around a brick fire pit, lipstick smudged champagne flutes, shirtless men in starlight, more screaming, a woman in a red dress, vacuum sealed, thick makeup, smudged, she threw her champagne flute into the fire, glass shattered, flames leapt, other women gasped and jumped back, a man said, what the hell, Kristen? What the hell, Kristen did not care, she bared her acrylic claws, she screeched at a nearby brunette. Anna, you bitch, if I ever see you with Carter again, it's over. Anna, you bitch, tossed her hair. Her shoulder was exposed. She wore a green dress, low cut. She called what the hell Kristen a fat slut. They fought. The camera focused on the shirtless man. His eyes were wide, bright from the fire. He smiled. The fire lit his teeth. Carter again? Maybe. I would not have fought for him. He was nothing like my husband, those stupid women. I studied my husband from behind. Study. A joke. What is there to study? I knew him completely. His hair, the grease shining faintly in the television light, his slumped shoulders, his wrinkled neck, yellowish, what might be considered jaundiced in a lesser specimen of humanity. I gripped the back of the couch tightly, crushing fingerprints into the velvet. I imagined the velvet was my husband's soft skin, his vulnerable neck. 
I never wanted to let go. But I did, of course. I had to clean my husband's bedroom. He did not like to make the bed, but I did. I smoothed the sheets with pride, no creases, not like his neck. I turned the top of the sheet over a folded edge of comforter, deep blue, quilted. It reminded me of Jamie's sleeping bag. We bought it for the annual neighborhood youth camping trip. Not much of a trip, just to the park, just for a night. The comforter felt like that. Temporary, fabricated, plastic. Clothes on the floor, stained white undershirt, crumpled plaid robe, hole ridden boxers. I had sewing needles in my left hand. I mended the holes. Then I put the clothes in the hamper. I smiled my hardworking smile. I tried not to notice the hand, that curled feminine hand creeping out from under the bed, its intensely reflective skin, burning pink against the taupe carpet, horribly bright, like bloodstains on gingham. She stood out in that bedroom like a crime, like a murder. Canned laughter in the living room. My husband was watching a different program, or maybe the same. It was all the same, all the same audience, same laughter. And there was a studio in my head, too. Rows and rows of seats in my mind, rigid seats, people sitting, laughing at me, Susan, Sharon, and Karen in the front row. And Karen's laugh was loudest, like always. Knock, knock. Who's there? Sarah. Sarah who? Sarah cannot satisfy her husband physically. He created a second robot replica of the other Sarah to fornicate with. The replica has bigger breasts and a more flexible mouth. The replica does not have to smile. The replica has no responsibilities. She is likely non-sentient. When she is not in use, she lies under the bed. She has no capacity for love and unhappiness. Ha ha ha! But I am an understanding wife. More understanding than they would have been. My husband uses her, but he depends on me. I am useful. She is not. She is not a woman. She is a thing, a toy. I am not jealous of her. I do not care what they do in the bedroom. She is the bedroom. But I am the kitchen, dining room, living room, bathroom, hallway, roof, floor, window. I am the door being slammed, the hum, the refrigerator, the television light in his eyes. I looked away from her beckoning hand. There was a piece of paper on the other side of the bed, a small square. I did not know that it was a photograph officer. I had no reason to suspect. Why would my husband own something so archaic? but my husband is a man of distinguished tastes. He has a vintage car, so old that it would likely not survive a flight to the city without disintegrating. Of course he keeps photographs. Of course he does. Stupid. I should have known this at the time, but I was surprised. I saw the photograph. I saw my husband smiling. My husband was so handsome when he smiled. His hair was shorter, mostly pale brown. His face was less lined. His shoulders were straight. He looked taller, younger, happier. He had his arm around her. I did not look at her, no need. Her features were mine, but sloppier. Of course I am prettier. Why else would my husband have made me this way? Jamie was also in the photograph, also smiling, missing a tooth. I smiled my indulgent smile. Two sets of flawed teeth, a quirk of human design. I corrected that in Jamie. I extracted each imperfect tooth. I implanted new ones. They will never fall or be replaced, like mine. Jamie cried, of course. Children can be so ungrateful, and I was even kind enough to keep her conscious throughout the procedure. A monster, officer. But what frightens you more? Gushing blood, whirring drills, or waking unexpectedly to a new state of being, finding yourself incrementally less human? I wanted Jamie to understand what was being done, so she would not be afraid. Jamie was in the photograph. She wore light green, a frilly dress, bizarre, and a conical headdress, pink, purple polka dots. There was a pink cake a frosted fire hazard. She leaned toward the candles. Her eyes were closed. I left the bedroom. I did not want to think about the photograph, or the body under the bed, or my fingerprints in the couch, or how Jamie's heartbeat only slowed when there was a door between us. I had my husband's permission to use his laboratory. I had experiments to conduct, a purpose. Even with Jamie in bed and the cleaning done, with my husband shuffling into the bedroom, I did not need it, this lesser fulfillment, this small thing of my own. But I had it. Every spare second until Sunday, cooking in chemistry, cooking in calculus, lemon squares, lemon cubes, lemon squares squared, lemon squares in one dimension, in two, in three, until I completed my masterpiece, something the other Sarah never could have made. Lemon squares in all dimensions. The Bake Off is always in the lemon grove at the end of the street. Wives compete, husbands stay home, children swarm a nearby playground, an ugly structure, bulbous, bright yellow, in the middle of a pit of torn phone pieces. The foam might have been blue at one point, and I do not like it when the swings reach the apex, the chains squeal, the merry-go-round shrieks as it turns, the seesaw sinks with a crash, dangerous sounds, and the children, running, scabbard knees, 
skin breaking open, needing band-aids, teeth falling out, empty mouth grins, bodies at war with biology, in a constant state of collapse. Every child at that park will die. Every mother. I killed a few women. Biology will kill the rest. Jamie said nothing. She did not like the playground. Like me. We reached the end of the street together. There was a forking path, imitation wood chips, left, playground, right, lemon grove. Jamie went left without wishing me luck, without saying goodbye. Officer, once you have my confession, is it possible? Y yes, the crime. Of course. I went right. The path cut through an expanse of grass, not the same grass as our front lawns, longer, darker, cut less often, meant to look wild, but it could still be flattened by a pedicured foot in sandals. There were dozens of those that morning. There were four picnic tables in the grove with yellow gingham tablecloths. They formed a loose semicircle. Lemon tree branches blocked the sun intermittently. Women stood at the tables in spotted darkness. I paused. I smoothed the wrinkled foil covering my lemon squares. I held the pan to my chest. I would not risk sabotage, not from those petty wives, Karen especially. I looked at the women. I looked down. The foil was smooth, like a mirror. I saw myself. I did not look human. I looked flawless. The pan was hot in my palms. After all that time, a faint vibration traveled at my arms, then down my spine. Not anticipation. Something more powerful. I approached the table. I lived in number 13 lemon square loop. Susan was number 12. I stood beside her. I placed my lemon squares on the table, behind the placard with my number. Susan nodded, but she was already talking to number 11. Something about her husband. He said he wanted to come, but you know how men are, she said. She rolled her eyes while smiling. She smiled as if she loved him. She spoke as if he loved her, as if she trusted him to love her even when she rolled her eyes. I recalled my departure from home that morning my last exchange with my husband. I smiled my sweetest smile. His hands were empty, but his fingers curled like the bodies under the beds. He did not smile back. I did not need him to, of course not. I said, goodbye, my dear. Would you like a kiss before I go? I ask every day, every time I leave him. I do not fear rejection. If my husband rejects me, it is because I deserve it. He did not kiss me, not like the television husbands and wives, not like the soccer moms and their soccer mates. He did not touch me. My husband never touches me, but he loves me. I was made to be loved. I was made for him to be all that he wanted. And I was, I am. He said no, always, but I did not dwell on it, officer. I told myself that I would not think about that morning. I would not think about Susan, Sharon, Karen, my husband's neck, his eyelids, his lips, Jamie, her perfect teeth and a body that would rot that was already rotting, or the reek of bleach and grout and tiles, the bleak light of the laboratory, not the body under the bed and my husband plunging into her, the other other Sarah. I would not think of the other Sarah, no. Just lemon squares, just victory, justice. The judges had arrived, three of them, women from neighboring streets, presumed neutral, they were respected, or what passes for respected among women. Two I knew only by name. The third was Piper Dunleavy. Everyone knew her. Her sister had cancer. She had gone to the city for treatment. No one expected her to come back. Amy Dunleavy, the type to clutch her cross and cry at school board meetings. She used low quality makeup on purpose so it would run, so she would look wounded, so she would get her way, so that boys would have boy names and boy bathrooms, so that girls would be safe. Pink girls with pink names, biological women with bodies she approved of. Not girls like Jamie, not women like me. Amy Dunleavy was a proud supporter of the God's Only Children movement, head of the local chapter. She organized rallies for people who hated me, who believed robots are a perversion of God's design, usurpers of the kingdom of heaven, as if I am jealous. I do not need an afterlife to see God's face. I see the face of my God every day, and I am a mother. I am not anyone's child. Amy Dunleavy said that I was not a woman, just a machine, a mockery. When I was crafted with intent, when I was made to be a wife and mother, she said that, a human, only female due to a collision of proteins in utero, a biological coin flip. And she thought she was superior. It is unfortunate that she had cancer. She might have been a judge instead of Piper. Piper was negligible, a Sharon whose Karen happened to be dying. She was thin, but her red hair was not. She complained about humidity. Her cheekbones were high, sharp, plastic. She resembled her sister. They might have shared surgeons. I smiled my anticipatory smile at Piper. She shuddered. Why? It was summer, sunny, and she was warmly dressed. But humans are weak. The other two judges were Laura Conrad and Lauren Connors, both blonde, dressed in white blouses and floral patterned skirts, carrying clipboards. It is not worth remembering which is which. 
They were talking to number two at the far end of the semicircle. I was impatient, but I did not show it. I glanced at Susan's lemon squares. They were uncovered, on top of a translucent blue plate with whorled edges. Susan saw me studying it. Do you like it? It's an antique. I traced its many grooves with my eyes. It was bright, pretty. Did your husband buy it for you? I asked. I will admit it. I daydreamed. I imagined my husband buying a plate like that for me, as a reward for winning. But Susan inherited it from her mother. I lost interest. Susan went back to talking with Eleven, a rodent-faced woman. Ten, nine, eight. Karen and Sharon were six and seven, next-door neighbors. They laughed. Then they saw me watching them. Their faces turned hard, but not as hard as mine. The contest began. One, two, three, four, five, six. Karen McMitchell. She interrupted the impartial tasting process to talk about Laura Lauren's beautiful rose gold tennis bracelet, Laura Lauren's luscious lashes. She turned to Piper Dunlevy. Karen's mouth was still, for once. Then she said, you know, your foundation is absolutely stunning, Pipes. It was not. Her skin was chalky. She had dark circles under her eyes. Piper did not react to Karen. She tasted a lemon square. She turned to the other judges. She asked, does this taste a little too sweet to anyone else? Hen scratched paper. Karen went red. Her foundation was not stunning enough to hide that. Seven. Sharon's lemon squares were too sweet to eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Susan's hands trembled as she lifted her plate. The edges of the glass caught the sunlight. Blue light shone onto the yellow tablecloth. It turned emerald. The judges gasped. Susan's smile was small but proud. It's an heirloom, she told the judges. Well, you're clearly getting points for presentation, said Laura and Laura. Laura Lauren nodded. When Piper spoke, her voice was muted. My sister had a plate like that. Did it break? Susan asked. Old glass can be so fragile. I have to hand wash this and no hot or cold water either, or it might crack. Piper Dunleavy stared. Then she registered Susan's words. What? No, she still has it. She shook her head. She's still alive. <laughs> a shaky laugh. I don't know why I'm using past tense. Laura Lauren and Lauren Laura pronounced Susan's lemon squares a triumph. The flavor was subtle. I knew my lemon squares were a triumph, and I did not have much use for subtlety. Then Piper Dunleavy's face crumpled. She cried. The other women cried out. They crowded around her. They touched her shoulder, her hair, her back. How could she stand it? It's just so hard, she gasped. Oh, God. Oh, God. She buried her face in her hands. I know, honey. I know, said Karen. Karen had wormed her way through the crowd. Of course. Karen put an arm around Piper's shoulders. Stay strong, girly. Amy wouldn't want you to fall apart like this. Piper wailed. A snot bubble burst from her nose. Karen's mouth puckered. Laura and Laura and Laura Lauren took small steps back. Well, you know, pray on it, said Karen. She patted Piper's back, gingerly. Slowly, Susan raised her prize plate. Then she threw it, hard. It shattered on the grass. The women cried out, like the women on television, the ones drinking champagne around the fire. But I did not look at them. I stared at the broken plate, the ruined lemon squares, yellow crumbs, shards of blue, green grass. The chatter died down. Susan took Piper's hand. For Amy, she said. There were tears in her eyes. Eleven shoved her plate off the table. For Amy! Karen rushed to her table. By the time she picked up her tray, she had been beaten. Several women tossed their plates already, but she threw hers too. For Amy! For Amy! Two words, a dozen women with a single voice. For Amy! I clutched my tray. I worried one of the other women would get to it. I would not let that happen. I would not let these women take my victory. Piper Dunleavy dried her tears. She even smiled. She said, I don't think we need a winner today. What happened here just now, we all won. Susan embraced her. The other women piled on a suffocating heap of flesh. I stood alone. I held my tray even tighter. I stared at them, that shifting mass. No husbands or children, only women. Arms around shoulders, cheeks against cheeks, hands entwined, women, women, women. I do not know what I felt. Perhaps sickness, perhaps nothing. I do not know. I stood apart. I did not want to be a part of this, this inexplicable thing. Of course not. And it was very explicable. It was a ploy, obviously. Everything was for these women. They contrived this to exclude me, to ruin me. Susan's glass plate, Piper Dunleavy's tears, lemon square smashing, plate throwing, embracing. It could not have been spontaneous. It could not have been genuine. Not for Amy Dunleavy. Not that self-righteous bitch. No. They knew I would win the Bake Off. They had no choice but to derail the competition, and they did, but I would not let them win. I raised my volume as high as it would go. I raised my chair of lemon squares. I told them all, I have not been judged yet. Piper Dunleavy's mouth fell open. 
Susan's forehead wrinkled. Sharon looked to Karen. Karen broke apart from the collective. The rest drifted apart, too. Her departure gave them permission. They could drop the act. Karen shoved me. If I was human, I would have fallen, but I did not even drop my lemon squares. There's your judgment, you freak, Karen spat. Yeah, said Sharon. She savored the word, red sauce, whatever. Freak! A few others murmured it. The voices rose in multitude, magnitude. I heard it everywhere. Freak! Karen McMitchell stood in a patch of sunlight, triumphantly, golden hair gleaming. She glared at me while smiling. She did not smile like she wanted to destroy me. She smiled as if she already had, as if she had won. But Susan, Susan made me angry. She placed herself between Karen and I. She held out her arms, not straight and slim, flabby, the undersides dimpled, and she extended them. Why? To protect me? The fat slut? Leave her alone, Susan pleaded. She didn't ask to be made like this. As if there was anything wrong with how I was made, how my husband made me. But the others agreed. A few lowered their gaze. Women who had called me a freak seconds ago. Even Karen turned away. They pitied me as if I was not perfect, as if I was not loved, as if they had the rights. They did not, officer, and I did not pity them, not when I tore the foil off my lemon squares. No, I did not know it would kill them, but I am not sorry it did. Why did it kill them? I do not know. There were no airborne toxins, nerve agents, corrosive chemicals, but the human mind is limited. Perhaps a three-dimensional lemon square is all it can withstand. I do not know what they saw, but I saw colors, officer, colors beyond human comprehension. Then the colors leapt from the tray. They invaded everything. The sky shone like an oil slick. The grass shifted hues like fire, endless burning brilliance leaping from one wavelength to the next. And I smiled, and my smile was yellow, not lemon yellow, not Jersey couch jaundice, yellow like the sun is yellow, yellow only in approximation, too vast and too bright for human words to ever hold power over it. Susan first. She was closest, still standing in front of me, her hair singed, then smoked. On her head, her wide arms, she screamed, hair sloughed from her scalp, then skin. I saw her skull, her brain, her cerebral spinal fluid sizzled, like bacon fat, like another breakfast my husband would not eat, another smile that would make Jamie scream. Susan fell, dead. The other screamed, but not for long. I do not feel like humans do, but I imagine their skin became electric. I imagine that it hurt, but I do not know. It could have been the opposite. The electric fence of skin turned off, the mind free to wander, to want. It might have been like meeting God, or becoming one. I thought of my husband. Of course I did. But in a strange way. If he was there, he would have died. Exactly like those women. Those creatures I despise. He was one of them. He was flesh and biology, limited, human. I recoiled, as any good wife would. Not my husband. Not my creator. No. I pictured him lovingly, every slick hair, every delicate fold, every pulsing vein, and I thought, why? I laughed. Knock, knock. Who's there? Why? Why who? Why did I enter this competition? Why did I think my husband would care? Why did he make me need him so much? Why didn't he realize how much it would hurt? Why didn't he care? Why did I do this? Why do I hate those women? Why do I love my husband? Horrible thoughts. Recent events must have uncalibrated me. A temporary destabilization. I know this, officer, because I thought of Jamie next, to prove that I was still myself. There was no why when I thought of my daughter. I heard shouting in the distance, children, they heard the screams, their mothers, but not Jamie. I pictured her standing some distance from the playground, tearing dandelions. She would not come running. Her mother was already gone. Yes, I know. But I teach her calculus at the kitchen table. I feel her heartbeat through walls. When I take her to soccer practice, I pull her by the hand. Her skin is soft against mine. Tell me I will see her again, officer. Please. Welcome back, everyone who just skipped the reading I spent 45 minutes working on and who knows how long editing. Let's get into the commentary. So the first line is already evidence of the revision process because the whole paragraph about the teeth in the glass of water, everything up until the line, of course I killed them. That was all added in in my December revisions before the contest. I originally started with the confession because I felt like that was a really punchy beginning, you know? The minute you hear someone's died, you're intrigued. And I was really worried avoiding something that editors refer to as the red line of death. What is the red line of death? Well, basically, if an editor receives a bajillion short story submissions for a contest or an anthology or what have you, and they always do, 
they are going to read up until the point where they are able to make a decision. And sometimes that's all the way through, but more likely than not, it's the first page, the first few lines. They may not have a literal red pen in hand because it's the 21st century, but you know, in their minds, there's sort of a red line that goes through the page after a certain word and they just stop reading, stop engaging, throw the story aside and move on. I was writing this story thinking about everything I could do to avoid falling victim to the red line of death. And that meant that by a word by word basis, I was thinking, what am I doing to drive the story forward, to give it momentum and to bring the reader along? Why is the reader still reading? That is a question that it can be hard to answer every single word. Like, you know, if you're saying the or and or whatever, but you know, in a broader sense, it's just thinking, what does this add to the story? Every single word you put on the page, what is it doing? And so I worried that the previous paragraph about the teeth and the glass of water, that it was maybe too mood setting, too ambient, and that it wasn't as direct as the confession and therefore it shouldn't be there. However, I felt like it was important to give the reader an emotional connection to Sarah right away because otherwise she risks coming off as a really unlikable one-note character. You know, she's very snide, she doesn't care about the people that she killed, and that can make it unappealing to read too. So maybe I wouldn't get the red line of death because the plot's not moving quick enough, but I would get the red line of death because the character isn't complex enough. At the end of the day, I decided it was more important to lean on the strength of the character and to give the reader a reason to believe that Sarah is going to be interesting to follow no matter what her story is. And then it turns out her story just so happens to involve murder, so that's a lot of fun. After the humans leave their teeth in the cup of water sometimes, it's revealed that she is talking to a police officer. I was very intentional about where I use the word officer. It's meant to evoke the specter of authority that's leaning over this story and to make it seem like Sarah is sort of reaching out and trying to appeal to a higher power, especially at the very end. The last line of the story is, tell me I will see her again, officer, please. So it's sort of bookended by these appeals to the authority and it underscores how helpless Sarah ultimately is. She is trapped. Something else that first line does is it establishes that Sarah is not human, right? Because a human being would never say humans do this. So we're already establishing that this is an outside perspective and one that doesn't necessarily understand humans all that well. It doesn't realize that, you know, dentures are different from actual teeth and it doesn't pick up on why or when they would be removed and for what reason. And this is later underscored by the fact that Sarah says, you know, I've seen this on television. So right from the beginning, we know that Sarah is an outsider looking in. And the teeth in the glass of water thing is a metaphor for motherhood, which Sarah makes evident herself. So let's look at how this metaphor functions, right? So what's happening is that you are giving up something that you love, something precious and delicate that should be inseparable from you, you know, your heart, your child, and you're offering it up to the wider world. And the world is a cruel place, and this cruelty and the relinquishment to this cruelty is inevitable. And I thought it'd be interesting to show that this is a robot who is choosing to use a very physical and visceral metaphor when talking about motherhood. For all the distance implied in the first few sentences, you know, humans do this, I've seen it on television. This very visceral metaphor hints at a raw humanity within Sarah that becomes especially pronounced when we see her love for Jamie. Then we get Sarah's first knock-knock joke. Knock-knock who's there, irony, irony who. So Sarah's knock-knock jokes are an interesting element of the character, and they're one that have been around since the novelization process. So they weren't there in the first draft of the short story, but they've been around for a couple years. So the knock-knock joke becomes a form where Sarah takes something simple and repetitive with a fundamentally limited format and really makes it her own. It becomes a microcosm of how she has this battle against her own programming to express herself within these narrow limits. With these knock-knock jokes, she's able to reveal deep vulnerabilities behind the mask of humor, even if they aren't concealed all that well, which is also a very human thing. I mean, not that I would know. I would never conceal darkness with humor. Also, I'm not human. Then Sarah goes on to talk about all the things these women do. You know, they buy their fancy napkins and have brunches and go to Broadway revivals. And I specifically mentioned the machine rendered corpse of Michael Crawford. Now you might be asking, Solaris, why do you keep bringing Michael Crawford up in this story? I'm sure it has some deep symbolic resonance, right? Yes and no, okay? Listen, I first wrote the story, like I said, when I was in college, and when I was in college, I was really into Phantom of the Opera. Like, I had a cape, I had the mask, I had a big stupid hat, and I took a picture of myself and I was like, hi, Gerangenews. Like, I was a little freak, okay? I was at Discord servers, I 
was obsessed with Phantom of the Opera, and I honestly still am. It's just sort of like a sleeper agent fixation. I listened to the soundtrack by Candlelight on Halloween alone, of course, as you would expect. So you could say I'm still interested to this day. Anyway, I added Michael Crawford in because I thought it would be funny, but also I thought that it made sense because at the time the story was not set in the future. It was just sort of present day, but also there's robots. I hadn't thought it out very well. I was in college, okay? I was like 20. I didn't know anything. So I was 20 years old, you guys. I didn't know that robots weren't real. <laughs> That's so stupid. It also seemed like a very waspy suburban mom thing to be interested in, so I thought it'd be a fun way to, you know, sneak in something that I liked while also setting the scene, so to speak. Also, I think Michael Crawford functions really well as like a symbol of nostalgia because obviously, you know, it's a bygone era by the time the story takes place, but it's also already the past for us, so we can really connect with it on that level. And also, incorporating Phantom of the Opera specifically as the big musical they all keep referencing. I think that works with the story because Phantom is a romance, you know, and it underscores the lack of passion in Sarah's own relationship. The first indication Sarah gives that she might even slightly care about what she's done is when she says, oh, and the children might miss their mothers. She's not sure. But then she says that she wonders if our child is missing her now to say nothing of my husband. So I'm just going to talk about the naming convention here. So originally they're both referred to by these generic titles by Sarah, my husband, my child, and they're capitalized in the text like you would a proper noun. We're not sure if they're capitalized because these are taking the place of the name or because they're serving as a title. It's also telling that she never deviates from calling her husband my husband but she does change how she addresses her daughter. Jamie goes from being our child to Jamie, not only her name, but a name that she chose for herself. And then at the very end, Sarah calls her my daughter. And it's uncapitalized, like any mother would write it, which shows how organic this love is in comparison to the program devotion to her husband, who's more of a deity figure almost, you know, like my husband is capitalized the same way that like God would be capitalized. There's also a note of possessiveness in the hour and the my, you know, she only allows these people to exist in relation to herself. So even as she's supposedly showing her husband deference, he is still her husband. She is repeatedly staking that claim and in a way asserting her dominance over him. And that's a theme we're gonna see repeated throughout the rest of the story. So Sarah then reveals that Sarah is an acronym that stands for Subautonomous Rearing Assistant. Now, the meaning behind those letters has changed over time. Originally, I had it listed as Semi-Autonomous Romantic Abreaction, which will still appear in the novelization, but in a different context. I thought rearing assistant suited Sarah better since the husband is clearly not interested romantically interacting with her in any real way and is basically just using her as a servant. And then the subautonomous is important because that is a legal category. That is a distinction that legally has to be made in the creation of a robot. You can either be autonomous, subautonomous, or non-autonomous. And that comes into play in the novelization, which concerns itself with Sarah's trial. And the legal classification of a robot obviously affects the way that their trial is going to play out because you wouldn't punish a non-autonomous robot the way you would an autonomous being. Sarah lists off the emotions that she experiences like sadness, anger, and hatred, and says that it is inconceivable for her to feel them toward her husband. Now, this is just something people say like, I can't believe it, inconceivable. But in Sarah's case, it's literal. She has actually been programmed to be unable to conceive of feeling negatively toward her husband. And this repression is enforced throughout the text by just how often she denies things. You know, the lady doth protest too much, so to speak. The word inconceivable is immediately followed up by Sarah saying, that is not the reason those women are dead, which causes the reader to start questioning the interrelation of those two. After that, Sarah starts talking about soccer practice in the soccer field, and it's revealed that the story takes place in a location called the Suburban Ring. So the suburban ring was an addition I made in the novelization process. I didn't want the setting to be just a boring suburban neighbor that happened to have robots. The idea of a suburban ring orbiting the city was very striking visual that led to a lot of interesting world building questions that were really helpful in fleshing out the novel. I don't get into it too much in the short story because it's not really about the world, so to speak. It's more about Sarah's internal drama. And I didn't want to get too bogged down in the technical aspects and slow down the arc of the story. So you just get a little taste of it here, but it is sort of uncanny as the suburbs floating around the city. If it wasn't a Christo-fascist hellscape, I would love to live on the suburban ring, just floating high above the clouds in the city. Like it just seems like very whimsical. However, Sarah does not emphasize the whimsical aspect of the suburban ring. Instead, she focuses on the sort of tenuous nature of the structure. And then she brings up the expression in God's hands. 
And I like that passage there because Sarah is not only challenging people's faith in religion or their own safety, but in humanity itself. God as they know it is inextricable from technology. She constantly mentions that God's hands are steel. God's hands are heavy because of the gravity generators. You know, God is inextricable from technology. And only Sarah understands this because she is made of technology herself. And in that way, she is closer to godliness than all these humans that look down on her. It creates this underlying sense of unease that hopefully lingers throughout the story, even when the rest of the suburbs are described in fairly conventional ways. You know, the soccer field, the playground, the house, it's all on top of this ever-shaking foundation. Sarah goes on to compare herself to the suburban rings and then uses it as a metaphor for, you know, her killing those women. She says, my life was perfect, I spun in the sky, I knew my place, I stayed there. The positive connotations start really strong at the beginning, right? She starts off by saying her life was perfect, then the idea of spinning in the sky like a star, that's kind of beautiful. But then it just degenerates into, I knew my place and I stayed. It's a decrease of energy, a decrease of beauty. It's showing the ugly emotional truth at the heart of all Sarah's fantasies that she spins about her married life. After that, we get our first physical description of Jamie and we also start getting descriptions of Sarah herself in correlation with her daughter. So Sarah talks about how Jamie's hair is sort of blowing in the wind and then says that her hair has no elastic. It's not tied back in a ponytail. It has nothing to escape from, no need. So the implication I was trying to get at here is that Sarah's hair is molded to her head rather than being made of any kind of fiber that can be moved independently. But it also parallels how she interprets her relationship with her husband. She couldn't escape if she wanted to, but fortunately she tells herself she doesn't want to. There's nothing to escape from, no need. And then we get Sarah talking about taking Jamie by the hand and pulling her forward, but taking that one moment just to look at her. So I pull her forward as sort of Sarah showing that she always does her duties as prescribed by her programming, but she goes beyond and even possibly defies them by stealing seconds to simply look at Jamie, to truly be there with her and to love her. However, she only starts referring to Jamie by name after being asked by the officer. In a sense, it's like she's been given permission by an authority figure to do so. However, she's also willing to display defiance towards this authority on Jamie's behalf, insisting that she be called by her chosen name rather than her birth name. Sarah said trans rights. She did kill a bunch of women, but she's a trans-inclusive radical misogynist. <laughs> However, everyone else refers to Jamie by her birth name, including Susan, Sharon, Karen, all written as one word. Uh, the blurring of names here is meant to show how interchangeable they are in this regard, how even if they can be differentiated by reader later on, in the end, they're all the same to Sarah because they all perpetuate the same ideas. And you can see the same sort of motif being played on the, at the Lemon Square Bake Off when we have Laura Lauren and Laura and Laura. Again, Sarah just doesn't care to tell the difference between these women. They're all sort of an amorphous mass to her, even as they distinguish themselves in some ways by being exceptionally petty or exceptionally kind in these smaller moments. And we'll see a bit more of this coming up when we get into Susan, Sharon, and Karen interacting with Sarah. However, before that, we get into Sarah talking about how these women call Jamie by her birth name because Jamie is a boy's name and boy and girl are biological categories for small humans. Now, in my earlier draft of the story, our child wasn't much of a presence and didn't have a name, so I only referred to her as our child and there weren't any pronouns, which led to the classmates in my workshop asking if the child was meant to be a boy or a girl, and I realized that I liked the ambiguity. I wrote a few drafts where I purposefully avoided any pronouns for the child, but during the novelization process, it became clear that Jamie was going to have to be a character and the whole zero pronouns can see, I mean, it can be done, but I felt like what I was going for could work just as well if Jamie was a non-conforming boy or non-conforming girl. So I decided to go ahead and make her a, a daughter. Is Jamie trans? Is she non-binary? Is she just a tomboy? Who knows? We don't know and we don't need to know. So in a sense, there is still that ambiguity there. All we need to know is that everyone is trying to put Jamie in a box and Jamie does not want to be there. And Sarah is supporting her getting out. This is one way in which Sarah is able to be transgressive. And I think it's interesting that she's doing it on behalf of her child. We see more of Sarah being an LGBT icon TM when she says that her womanhood is independent of the squirming and physical. I know that Sarah is not good LGBT rep, okay? She murdered a bunch of women. Most of us don't do that anymore. 
uh, you know, for non-binary people like me and, you know, maybe like Jamie, as well as trans people, there's something liberating about being able to transcend biological limitations and to accept ourselves and who we are independent of the squirming and physical and to recognize that the things that make us human have less to do with biology than the ways in which we're able to differentiate ourselves from what our biology tells us to be. Sarah then talks about how everyone's jealous of how pretty she is and talks about smiling her beautiful smile. So Sarah only ever smiles and this is something you can see throughout the story. She has her beautiful smile, her motherly smile, her proud smile, etc, etc. What I'm trying to imply here is that these are all the same expression. She can't help but smile. Her face is stuck that way. However, there's some attempt at empowerment in the fact that she chooses when to mention the smile and when not to. So you can almost imagine that her expression changes. Every time her smile is mentioned, it is her smile and she's describing what it means to her. So in that way, she's sort of taking back this expression that she's forced in. Sarah talks a little more about the neighborhood and then we get our first mention of the other Sarah. Without getting into spoilers for the novelization, uh, who exactly the other Sarah is has changed over the draft, but for the purpose of the short story, all that matters is that the reader understands that Sarah is a replacement of someone in her husband's life, so there aren't really any more hints about the other Sarah beyond that. Something else that is never made explicit in the short story but is explicit in the novelization is that the other Sarah was Chinese and that Jane Jamie, by extension, is half Chinese. I tried to put some coding in there, right? Jamie has her darker eyes that aren't as round as her father's, you know, stuff like that, but it wasn't super important for the context of the story, although it is more relevant in the novelization, and we see that ethnic identity explored more in the context of the other Sarah. A little down the line, we get the full names of Susan Hart, Sharon Dupinsky, and Karen McMitchell. So most of the last names were more or less just chosen to have a certain sound. Karen McMitchell sounded like the final boss of the Homeowners Association, and Dupinsky, you know, sounds like a dupe. She's not as sharp. She's a second fiddle to Karen. But it's no coincidence that Susan's last name is Hart, and she, of all the women, shows the most genuine emotion. It's pretty basic and cheesy, but you know, I'll stick by it. Then we have the scene where Sharon tries to steal Karen's compact, and I threw this in to establish Sharon as a lesser of sorts. She borrows from Karen and tries to take what she has for herself, like the compact, but is brought into line. Like Sarah, Sharon is someone who is made to know her place and stay there. So the woman makes some jibes about Jamie's dad not being there, and then Sarah mentions that he was watching television, a task worthy of his intellect. Saying that watching TV is a task worthy of his intellect, seems like a dig, and the justification Sarah offers after the fact can only combat that initial impression from the reader. It doesn't take it away entirely, you know? So it's meant to make the reader question how much of Sarah's admiration is genuine versus how much of it is just this irresistible programming. And then we have her say that watching TV is a form of inuring oneself to overstimulation, and her husband was very well inured. I added this line during my contest revision, and I wish I had it because I basically repeat it when Sarah talks about her husband drinking, and I like the line better there. But whatever, we'll get there when we get there. So sort of playing off what we've already established with Sharon in the compact scene, Sarah says that she existed for Karen's benefit. And I think this is one of the good examples of how everything Sarah hates about these other women could just as easily be applied to her, particularly the idea of existing for someone else's benefit. But when we get our description of Karen's shiny, rancid, raw meat, red lips, and then uh, the crack cocaine Michael Crawford comparison, these are both descriptions that I will stand by to a point, but I could not for the life of me explain them in more depth if anyone asked. Like, listen, does raw meat get redder when you leave it out of the fridge? I don't know. I have a fear of raw meat. I have to wear plastic bags on my hands to even touch it because I'm scared of it. Anyway, I don't know if that's what meat does outside of the fridge, and I don't necessarily know about the Michael Crawford. Like, I don't... I don't know, like, what does a TV detective sound like? How does that sound like a suburban woman talking about Michael Crawford? I don't... I have the vision. I have the sensation in my head. I hope I gave it the sensation to the reader. I don't know if I succeeded, and if I didn't, I can't fix it. I just have to go with my gut here and say, Crack cocaine, Michael Crawford. Here's where we start getting more indications that Susan is a little different from the other women. She actually takes the time to ask Sarah if she's been to see Phantom. However, the way she does it is still a way that is quite othering because she says, and what about 
you, refusing to call Sarah by name. And this is a way in which Sarah and Jamie have something in common. They're both denied names and with that recognition of their gender identity by the neighborhood women. Like Sarah, they don't have a lot of power over much of anything, but they are enforcers of the social order. And even the kindest, most lenient among them is a part of this police force. Susan Hart, for all her kindness, is still a part of the system. Sarah goes on to say, if I had a friend, it would have been Susan. And then says, if I wanted one. I don't feel like that line was necessary. I'll probably leave it out in future revisions, but that also could just be partially because I'm inclined to hear it the most ridiculous way possible because there's this like bootleg Phantom of the Opera musical adaptation where <laughs> I'll see I'll see if I can include the clip here. I could be rid of you if I wanted. So every time I read if I wanted one, I picture it with a Phantom's intonation and I also <laughs> Remember how when the Phantom swishes his cape, it audibly hits the Daroga's mic and there's just a muffled thunk? It gets me every time. So Sarah obviously has not seen Phantom, but she tries to make a little reference to it to win the other women's favor, and it doesn't go as expected. However, we see, again, an appeal to authority. See, officer, I knew the plot. This is Sarah trying to assert her belonging and, in a sense, her humanity, but it only reveals what she's- that a melodramatic romance like Phantom isn't about the plot. God knows it's not about the plot. It's about getting swept up in the emotion, the ones that she doesn't get a chance to experience. And then she goes on to say, why would I need that? To sit beside my husband in a darkened room, to hold his hand as the music swelled. How pathetic to need that, to need. <laughs> After this line, I just commented literally me. <laughs> How pathetic to need that, to need. That's why I'm anorexic. Anyway, moving on. Sarah talks about how the other women are always mentioning the other Sarah at various places like PTA meetings and the school Christmas luncheon. So originally I just wanted to throw in another sort of occasion that these waspy women would get together, and I chose to make it Christmas instead of a more general holiday lunch to show that this future, at least in the suburban ring in particular, is different from the present where there's at least a token effort to represent other cultures. As we'll see later, the suburban ring is a haven for a particular sect of Christo-fascists known as God's Only Children, and this is sort of our first light inkling about that. Sarah complains about how the other women kicked her out at the snack rotation. She rolled the worst blunt of all time and was asked to leave the rotation. <laughs> God, my sister did say that uh, Sarah and Amethyst from my uh, other project, Amethyst the Assassin, would be a nightmare blunt rotation, so there's that. Sarah talks about the various snacks that these women would bring, you know, bruised bananas, overprocessed fruit gummies, the rest. And the way she uses the rest here is meant to echo Susan, Sharon, Karen, the rest, like she said earlier. And this parallel shows that the women themselves are no more significant to Sarah than, you know, granola bars and gummy snacks. It's a very subtle kind of dehumanization. A little later, we get more description of Karen and her cross and her, um, you know, bazoongas. Why did I say that? Her bazoongas. Listen, my stepmom is watching Young Sheldon, so I just have Bazinga on the brain. It's not my fault, I promise. Anyway, we get a description of Karen, is what I'm saying. Sarah says, those were not God-given breasts, unless God is a plastic surgeon in the city. So again, like we see in this suburban ring passage, Sarah is linking God with the technological and demoting these women's beliefs to a mere mechanical contrivance. And this comes on the heels of Sarah pointing out how religion has been used to deny her womanhood. So we can see that these attacks against humanity and religion are really a form of self-defense for her. So Sarah decides that she's going to enter the neighborhood Lemon Square beat. I almost said the Lemon Square beat off. That would be a very different story. I don't know why I'm being so ridiculous all of a sudden. Okay, the Lemon Square Bake Off. Sarah decides she's going to enter and win, and she's not really competing against the women that are there. She recognizes that. Instead, she's competing against that woman. The one my husband loved first, the one Jamie cried for at night. So even when acknowledging the other Sarah and her husband's love of her directly, Sarah can't help but insist that she is loved too. And there's something so immediately and obviously futile about Sarah's plan that should make the reader a little sad, you know, without even having met her husband. You can probably tell by this point that winning a Lemon Square Bake Off is probably not going to change things. So we are now exiting part one and entering part two, because the story breaks down into three parts that are separated in the text by these little asterisks, you know, a scene. And these are just sort of natural scene breaks that come up in the course of the story, but they're also important for the novelization, because the way this story functions there is that each part, so part one, part two, and part three of the novelization, are each prefaced by a part of Sarah's confession. So what we just read would precede part one, 
this next chunk would be before part two, and the last scene, which is the whole Lemon Square Bake Off, that would be before the final part of the novel. So Jamie and Sarah are coming inside at this point, and Sarah mentions that Jamie's face is all red despite there being no obvious sign of exertion. I would hope the source of exertion, the fact that, you know, her mom is dead and replaced by a robot, would be pretty obvious to the reader, but again, Sarah does not understand human emotion. And then Jamie displays yet more human emotion by going, like anyone cares, and storming off. So it's a pretty typical child, preteen sort of outburst, but you have to wonder how much of it is actually true in Jamie's case. Her father cares enough to build a robot to take care of her, but not enough to be an active participant in her life. But while we can see that clearly Sarah does love Jamie, you know, you can definitely see why Jamie would question that herself. And, and that's made more clear in the following lines, where Sarah talks about waiting for the echoes of feeling to fade before approaching her husband. You know, she has to let the real emotion sort of settle down and fade away before she goes into the false fawning behavior that she displays around her husband. And we see more falseness in Sarah's actions towards her husband in the way she describes him, right? He does not have to wash or cut his hair to be beautiful. It's similar to the TV is a task befitting of his intellect thing. Sarah shows us these deliberately unappealing images of her husband and then tries to force a positive spin on it, but it's too late to wash away that underlying disgust and unease that she's already put in our minds. It's very twisted. So Sarah talks about how her husband is pretty absent and doesn't really pay attention to her and we get the phrase, I hate always, but I will always love my husband. So I hate always is a phrase that's being repeated from earlier, it comes up in the context of her complaining about Susan, Sharon, and Karen, but choosing to repeat it here right before she says that she will always love her husband. It sort of reminds us what that word means for Sarah and the imprisonment implied by it. And so it underscores the falsity of this assertion. Even if she does love her husband, a part of her at least hates the fact that she always has to. However, she does feel something when he acknowledges her and she says that she could never express the joy, joy, joy his voice sent shuddering through her. The stutter effect there is to make you think of a robot shutting down or a machine malfunctioning as if she is on some level actually incapable of tolerating this pleasure. But it also makes you think, like, is it pleasure? How much of what she's feeling is emotion versus programming? And how much of that stutter effect is just overwhelming joy versus being overwhelmed by this program joy and what she actually feels? It creates tension. Sarah Wax is poetic about how pure in comparison her love for her husband is compared to the other women. And she even goes as far as to say that it's better that the other women are dead. Sarah's hatred of the other women is in a sense just as fabricated as her love for her husband. She uses one to mask the other. And with this in mind, it's ambiguous how much Sarah actually believes things like this. You know, she's very glib about the fact that their deaths don't matter, but could this be a facade in the same way that her hatred of them is in a sense a facade? So Sarah describes kissing her husband and then follows it up with almost, but I could not. So until that point in the paragraph, you think Sarah is literally doing everything she describes, but then it's just revealed to be in her imagination. So this is meant to be sort of a glimpse of intimacy offered to the reader and then revoked. And then Sarah has her electric fence comparison. And she said, I do not feel as humans do, but it hurts. It hurts. Sarah is literally programmed to feel pain when she crosses the boundary set by her husband. The fact that she can't even think about kissing her husband without being in excruciating pain, but can coolly contemplate the death of a dozen women, it shows his priorities and really underscores the fact that Sarah's misogyny at the end of the day is co-signed, if not outright created, by her male creator. Sarah leaves her husband to do some chores and to make dinner, and she says that she was a good mother because she served plant batter with each meal. I just thought that was funny. Moms love to make a big deal about eating her vegetables. And then she goes on to describe Jamie eating her lasagna. And I feel like the metaphors get a little mixed here. You know, she looked at it like it was alive, like it needed to be killed, and then she vivisected it. If it's being vivisected, it's clearly not being killed. It should really be one or the other. Sarah flashes back to the first breakfast she ever cooked for Jamie. And we get a really crushing scene where Jamie cries out for her mother and then begs her dad to help. And the sitcom theme playing in the living room got louder. This is the deepest display of emotion we ever get from Jamie, who mostly just appears sullen and angry in the present. Here, with this scene, it's clear that this sullen, angry exterior is stemming from trauma, you know, related not just to the death of her mother, but the replacement of her mother with Sarah. Since the whole story is from Sarah's perspective and we know she loves Jamie, it can almost be easy to lose sight of how horrifying the situation is for her, like it is with the women. Are they unkind to Sarah? Yes, but considering she's a replica of a woman they used to know, they could be a whole lot meaner. Like imagine if your friend who ran a recipe blog died and then a robot that looked just like her was coming around with her kid to soccer practice the next day. Like you 
would be weirded out. And then the dad playing the sitcom theme shows that he has completely detached himself from Jamie's life once he's built Sarah to ensure that she receives a basic level of care. Not all sitcoms are about happy families, but they do tend to come to mind when you hear sitcom theme, you know? So especially when Sarah talks about like the smiling breakfast scene, so you can almost imagine that the husband is delving into fictional families to forget the reality of his own. Sarah later overhears a song playing in Jamie's room that's meant to be listened to backwards, and it's apparently a trend that summer. I was just trying to imagine what kind of music a kid might listen to in the future and thought the backwards gimmick was something. I wish I had the imagination to say what the futuristic equivalent of skibbity toilet bass boost and remix would be, but alas, I'm not there. So Jamie keeps listening to the music even after Sarah Sarah tells her to go to bed, much in the same way that the husband keeps listening to the sitcom even as Jamie screams, and Sarah refers to this as Jamie's electronic silence. Calling that silence electronic is almost making it seem like Jamie is a robot herself and sort of bringing her to Sarah's level in a sense. When I shared the story of my creative writing workshop in college, someone theorized that Jamie was a robot, which was never my intention, but I mean, I guess it's interesting. And I guess you could interpret it that way if you wanted to in the short story, but it's very explicit in the novelization that Jamie is a human. So then Sarah describes the skin on her middle finger peeling back to reveal the syringe. And I might have to change the way this is described because it's very similar to something the cyborgs in Amethyst the Assassin do, and I keep referencing Amethyst the Assassin. For those of you that don't know, that was my undergraduate thesis. It's a novel in progress. I currently have part one completed, but again, like Lemon Squares in All Dimensions, it is meant to be a three-part novel. If you're interested in checking it out, you can see the first chapter on my website, and maybe one day I'll release the negative first edition on ebook if anyone's curious enough to check it out. I don't think I would describe this element of a robot so similar across universes unless they were meant to be connected, which ATA and Lemon Squares in All Dimensions aren't at this point. Who knows, maybe the Solaris multiverse will come to be one day. So then Sarah leaves Jamie to go clean the bathroom and she can feel her heartbeat through the walls. And she says, I did not need to hold her to feel it. So this is meant to parallel all the forms of intimacy she claims she doesn't need from her husband despite desperately wanting. But the idea that she can feel Jamie's heartbeat through walls, referenced in the closing lines of the story, shows how Sarah's robotic nature, while it fundamentally drives her and Jamie apart, can also bring them together in these strange, unexpected ways. And it doesn't render Sarah incapable of love, but rather changes the way she expresses and perceives it. And we see another very quiet expression of that when she says, good night, Jamie, to the white wall. It's a sad, quiet moment, and stuff like this was really lacking in the earlier drafts. So Sarah was a far less nuanced and interesting character. It goes back to what I was saying about that first scene and needing to give the reader a reason to connect with Sarah and not just see, oh, she's a misogynistic hypocrite with a superiority complex. She is all those things, but she also is genuinely devoted to that child, and that is, in a sense, a saving grace for her. So Sarah starts talking about cleaning the kitchen, recalls a time she did it in the past when she was very excited because her husband actually asked her about it, and she was gratified that he showed interest and she's calm on the surface but beneath there was mutiny joy and i think it's interesting to note that sarah pursues joy despite having this almost adversarial relationship with it at times she perceives it as something she shouldn't have or doesn't deserve to feel and yet she has the capacity for it and in this sense joy functions similarly to desire it's something she can feel but feels conflicted about and it's interesting to think about what this says about the husband he creates this robot basically to do chores and watch the kid, but he does give it the capacity for love and joy. Why does he give her the capacity for joy? Does this hint at something redemptive within her creator and a desire to share humanity? Or is it motivated by something else? So Sarah fantasizes about kissing her husband again like she did earlier, and this scene I think is interesting in the way that it emphasizes the husband's frailty. She talks about his hand being delicate, soft as an eye, flesh and bone braced by metal. I would look in his eyes, my reflection would be there, my expectant smile he would lower himself. So this whole passage is emphasizing Sarah's strength in comparison to her husband's human frailty, and it sort of shows that her desire is not so much for him to love her, so much as to overpower and consume him, to take herself back from him, in a sense. However, even though Sarah cleaned the kitchen like her husband wanted her to, he is displeased and she has to scrub the kitchen even more. And she says, the kitchen sparkled, it did not matter, I was unclean. One of the things that I think is really tragic about Sarah is that she's, at least to some extent, aware of how futile most of what she does is, but has no chance to do it anyway. Like, she knows her husband doesn't care about the kitchen, but she cleans and cleans and cleans and cleans. She knows he doesn't love him, but she acts as if he does. However, this whole kitchen scene is in contrast to what's happening in the present of the story, where the husband does let her stay and watch TV with him. And she says the TV light is reflecting in his eyes, and it makes her think of Jamie's song and the lyric about lunar loneliness. She compares his eyes to moons. 
Sarah is just making a simple visual comparison, but her bringing up the song and the lyrics about loneliness, you know, really underscore her feelings. It's similar to the way the knock-knock jokes function, this is Sarah using a reference to hint at a deeper emotional truth that she cannot confess to on the surface. So after this, we get a scene describing what's going on in the reality show The Husband is Watching, where there's women fighting around a fire pit over a man named Carter. And you might be wondering, you know, why is there so much description of this random scene in the reality show when, like, Speed Sisters and the sitcom are just briefly summarized and passed over? I wanted to include this reality show to sort of serve as a microcosm showing how women's aggression towards one another can often stem from relation to men. Much like how Sarah claims to hate the other women when it's increasingly clear that she's actually experiencing is misplaced rage toward her husband. We also see Sarah culling language from this passage later when she calls Amy a bitch and Susan a fat slut. And I have those terms italicized there like you would a foreign language to sort of emphasize how Sarah is incorporating these foreign elements into her action. Not only does her, her innate programming prime her for misogyny, but she actively chooses to incorporate these elements from the world around her into her action. We also get the little detail that Sarah's husband might be considered jaundiced and a lesser specimen of humanity. And that is meant to clue us in on the fact that the man is literally dying of alcohol poisoning by this point in his life, and Sarah worships him too much to acknowledge it. He really built himself the best possible enabler. Similar to when she fantasizes about kisses, Sarah crushes the velvet of the couch with her fingertips, thinking about grabbing her her husband's vulnerable neck. Again, it's less about desiring him than desiring power over him. Then we get into the scene where Sarah's cleaning her husband's bedroom and says, I tried not to notice the hand. I have a comment here that just says, let's go. I really like the body under the bed. I don't remember if I had it in the original drafts. I definitely introduced it by the time of the novelization. There is some foreshadowing here in the way it's described, like blood stains on gingham. She stood out in that bedroom like a crime, like a murder. Then we get another knock knock joke from Sarah talking about about the body under the bed, which is what I'm going to refer to this um, other robot as. And Sarah says that she is likely non-sentient. Uh, the word likely is doing a lot of heavy lifting here because we just don't know. I feel like the fact that Sarah doesn't know and doesn't care to is honestly worse than just straight up confirming it because it shows that not only did the husband maybe create a sentient being just to lay under his bed when he's not using it, but that Sarah is willing to entertain the notion that this could be a being just as sentient and capable of emotion as her, and she makes no attempt at solidarity with it, no attempt to empathize. She just hates it and is jealous and is willing to leave it to rot. Sarah also argues that the body under the bed is likely incapable of love and unhappiness, and I think it's interesting that Sarah pairs the two here, cluing us into the fact that she's unhappy in love despite her protestations. Also, one of the biggest moments of Sarah's hypocrisy here when she says that the body under the bed is not a woman, she is a thing, a toy. So as upset as she gets at others for denying her womanhood, she doesn't hesitate for an instant to do it to the body under the bed. So yes, Sarah's life is tragic and it's complicated by this tragic inability to see that the only way out of it is by forming solidarity with people in the same situation rather than aligning herself again and again with her oppressor. But she goes on to try and assert the differences between herself and the body under the bed by saying she is the bedroom, but I am the kitchen, dining room, living room, bathroom, hallway, roof, floor, window. I am the door being slammed, hum of the refrigerator light and the television light in his eyes. So Sarah is trying to uplift herself at the body under the bed's expense, but at the end of the day, she still just considers herself a room, an inanimate object, a mere sensation for her husband to experience. And while there could be something positive or liberating about comparing herself to a door, a door being slammed evokes violence, you know, storming out after an argument, closing a door in someone's face. It complicates the image. She also compares herself to the television light in her husband's eyes. Sarah repeatedly emphasizes seeing things in her husband's eyes like light or her own reflection, which underscores how warped her perception of the world is and the fact that she can only see through the eyes he gave her, which can only perceive reality a certain way. So Sarah finds an old photograph of her husband and Jamie and the other Sarah, and then she talks about the fact that Jamie was missing a tooth, and we get what my siblings have affectionately referred to as the teeth scene. Uh, my brother and sister both commented on it, and I know I mentioned Sarah pulling out the kid's teeth in my earliest versions of the story, but I don't think I added the detail about Jamie being conscious during the procedure until I was working on the novelization. As my sister says, it works well in showing how Sarah doesn't understand humans, but I hate that it's here. <laughs> Her roommate also read the story and said, me when my robot wife takes my teeth. So the teeth scene is a hit with the kids, I suppose. So Sarah doesn't want to think about the photograph and she lists other things she doesn't want to think about, including how Jamie's heartbeat only slowed when there was a door between us. 
So this becomes even more clear later, but even as Sarah has some degree of denial about whether or not her husband loves her, she's able to acknowledge that Jamie doesn't. So then Sarah goes on to start making her lemon squares and she talks about the process and says how she actually enjoys it. Of course, she asserts that she didn't need it, this lesser fulfillment, this small thing of her own, but she had it. There's power in women being able to find fulfillment in something outside the home and family, which is something that Sarah has never had. And you know, I thought it was important to throw that in there because most of what redeems Sarah comes from her relationship to Jamie, and that could just be seen as wives shouldn't live for their husbands, but mothers should live for their children. This is just sort of a way to say that no, you know, you don't have to live for your husband, you don't have to live for your child, you can live for yourself. And this is Sarah acknowledging the pleasure in it while still at the same time saying, well no, I don't need that, I'm better than that but she's not. Part two concludes with Sarah completing her recipe for lemon squares in four dimensions, which as stewed readers may have noticed, does not match the title, which is lemon squares in all dimensions. The reason for the change isn't interesting, I just felt lemon squares in all dimensions seemed more fantastical than in four dimensions, which seemed more dry and mathematical to me. All right, so now we're on to part three, we're almost at the end. So Sarah and Jamie are heading towards the Lemon Square Bake Off, there's a grove and a park, and Sarah is describing the park in a very unpleasant way that is very much derived from how I experience the world with autism. Everything is very loud and chaotic and distracting. I don't know why I was trying to split the difference between distracting and destructive there, but you know what, it fits. Anyway, she's also talking about children and the fact that their bodies are at war with biology in a constant state of collapse and she reflects on mortality for a bit. However, after that she says that Jamie did not like the playground like me. So in comparing Jamie to herself, Sarah is sort of trying to save the girl from her own humanity. Like, like when she pulled her teeth out, it's her own twisted way of trying to save Jamie from the inevitable. However, after that they reach a fork in a path, Jamie goes one way, Sarah goes the other, and Sarah mentions that Jamie leaves without saying goodbye and then she goes, officer, once you have my confession, is it possible? While Sarah certainly doesn't regret her actions and even seems to boast about them at times, it's interesting how quickly she veers off track and loses interest once Jamie is involved. Her supposed hatred of these women doesn't sustain her as much as her love for Jamie. So Sarah goes and finds her table in the grove where the Lemon Square Bake Off is taking place and she ends up next to Susan Hart. And Susan's talking to the other person at the table with them, number 11, and rolls her eyes. And Sarah describes this as, She spoke as if he loved her, as if she trusted him to love her, even when she rolled her eyes. This is something really important for Sarah, who feels unloved even when she does everything right, like we saw with that kitchen scene earlier. And she sort of reflects on him leaving her husband earlier that morning and says that his fingers curled like the body under the bed. She's comparing him to the body under the bed, which is, you know, the sex robot. So you can see that Sarah has sex on her mind but isn't able to contemplate it directly, you know, it's another thing that she does not need and perhaps isn't even capable of conceiving of wanting. Honestly, I can relate to that. I can't conceive of wanting sex either. Hashtag asexual rights. Once again, Sarah is an LGBT icon. <laughs> I love problematic representation. <laughs> So the moment of judgment is approaching, they're about to start judging the Lemon Square Bake Off, and Sarah is thinking about all the things she doesn't want to think about, including, you know, Jamie with perfect teeth and a body that was, rot that was already rotting, or the reek of bleach and grout and tiles. I emphasize the word grout there because when I submitted this to the contest, I used the wrong word and said the reek of bleach and ground and tiles. Fortunately, I think it could be seen as like, oh, you know, the tiles are on the ground, so it might not be seen as like the most obvious mistake in the world, but it was a mistake. It was an error, and it just goes to show no matter how many times you edit it, no matter how many times you revise a story, you are going to make a mistake. You are going to suffer, and you are going to wake up sweating in the middle of the night thinking about when you wrote ground instead of grout. You will be haunted for the rest of your life affirmations. So speaking of mistakes and inconsistencies, let's talk about Amy Dunleavy. So Amy is the sister of Piper Dunleavy, one of the judges at the Bake Off, who is currently in the city receiving cancer treatment. Now this is something that I changed very recently in my revision process for the competition. So originally I had Sarah basically electrocute Amy and lead to her being physically and mentally compromised, but no one knows that Sarah did it. However, Amy is sick, she's out of the picture, and the other women react to her, you know, much in the way they do here now that she has cancer. 
The reason I decided to change it is because I felt like it dampened the impact of the lemon square scene if we already have Sarah, you know, physically harming another woman earlier in the story, you know, before the story even takes place. I just felt like it was unnecessary, so I decided to go with cancer instead and have it be completely unrelated to Sarah, but she would still be sick, the women could still commiserate, we could still have, you know, the plate breaking and all of that. I think at first I was originally going to go whole hog and have her die of cancer sentences that have not been said before. I don't think whole hog, I'm gonna go whole hog and die of cancer, fault in our stars, eat your heart out. Um, anyway, I'll uh, remember what I said. I was gonna do a video essay on John Green one day. I was gonna have her die of cancer. Then I realized that didn't make sense because Piper talks about, oh, you know, I don't know why I'm using the past tense. So that is an inconsistency in the text that I should have caught but did. Now, Amy might have cancer, but she's clearly not a sympathetic figure in the text. Sarah says that Amy Dunleavy said, I was not a woman, just a machine, a mockery, which we can see echoes her talking about the body under the bed, saying that she was not a woman, she was a thing, a toy. So sort of like her incorporating the reality TV words into her vernacular, we can see her sort of replicating the misogynistic dynamics that she sees around her. Sarah is not overawed by Amy Dunleavy, and she says that she is only female due to a collision of proteins in utero, a biological coin flip, and that literally is how gender happens, you know? The sperm hits the egg and you form a certain way, which is part of why I find it really hard to have any kind of meaningful attachment to my birth sex to the point where I want to express it as a gender identity. You know, it just doesn't mean anything to me because it's so irrelevant and divorced from anything that I choose to do or be or value. And that sort of goes back to what I was saying about womanhood independent of the squirming pink and physical. Because it is possible for womanhood to be incredibly meaningful for people. And I think, you know, no one epitomizes that more than trans women who, independent of the squirming and physical, they are able to see something of value in that gender identity and pursue it no matter what consequences it brings them. I think that's really beautiful. And really seeing that in other people was what caused me to realize, oh, I do not have that connection to my gender identity. It does not mean anything to me. And why should I go around, you know, accepting a label that I don't think says anything about me? You know, so that's why I consider myself non-binary or agender. That's why I use they, them pronouns, because I do not care about collisions of protein in utero and biological coin flips. So after that, we get a bit of a physical description for Piper Dunleavy, and Sarah mentions that she has a resemblance to Amy, particularly in the cheekbones, which she goes to ascribe to a shared surgeon. So the idea that they look alike because they're related doesn't even occur to Sarah, and that shows how Sarah is always tying things back to technology or in relation to these other women, tying it back to some sort of artifice or trick. We see this particularly with the plate smashing scene. She cannot ascribe genuine emotion or meaning or connection behind anything these Speaking of the plate smashing scene, let's talk about Susan's blue glass shiny plate. So Sarah is originally interested in it because she wants a gift like that from her. However, once Susan reveals it was actually inherited from her mother, Sarah loses interest. Now it's no longer a symbol of male approval, but rather the bond between women, and that is not something she is invested in. Again, this goes to show Sarah is incapable of understanding, you know, solidarity between women and the importance of making connections with others. So the women go through and they test everyone's lemon squares, and eventually they get to Susan's and they ooh and aw over her pretty plate shining in the sunlight. Then Piper mentions that Amy used to have a plate like that, and then she has like a shaky laugh, realizing that she was using the past tense. So even though the reader has no reason to like Amy, I hope there's still something touching about Piper's vulnerability here so we can understand that Amy, you know, as hateful she might be to us, is genuinely loved within this community and the women considered one note suburban caricatures by Sarah have complex emotional lives of their own. Piper breaks down crying and the other women, you know, sort of ineffectually try to comfort her and Sarah is repulsed by the physical affection between women and asks how could she stand it in reference to Piper being patted on the shoulder in the back and so on. Not only does she not understand the point of women interacting and supporting with one another, but the idea disgusts her. And it's unclear, like most things are with Sarah, how much of this is learned misogyny versus programmed revulsion? How much does her husband stand to benefit by having Sarah react in this way to the idea of forming connections with other women? And then we get some false sugary sweet nicey nice nonsense from Karen, who is very MLM hun coded, getting into the DMs to make you sell LuLaRoe. She says, stay strong, girly. Amy wouldn't want you to fall apart like this. The girly is doing a lot of work, I feel like. The point here is that Karen's fake self-serving niceness versus Susan's genuine sacrifice. 
right? Because Susan's sacrifice is destructive. It's disruptive. It breaks something pretty, something valuable. But this jagged, broken ugliness creates an opportunity for beauty to arise in the connection these women are able to make. You know, she experiences a loss to sort of echo Piper's loss, obviously not to the same extent, but just to show that she is willing to be in pain with Piper. The other women experience this crying, this catharsis. They all come together after Susan breaks that plate. However, Sarah fails to see any of this, and she cheapens this moment by comparing to the one lady on the reality show tossing her champagne glass in the fire before going on to call someone else a bitch. To her, it's all equally fake and worthless. So Sarah's inability to find meaning in Susan's sacrifices underscored by the fragmentation of language at the end of the paragraph where it says yellow crumbs, shards of blue, green grass. It echoes the fragmented way she views the world. She can see the details, but not the big picture. She can see that Susan broke her plate, but she can't see why. And then the other women start throwing their plates, mashing their lemon squares, and everyone's yelling for Amy, for Amy. And Piper's finally able to dry her tears. And she says, what happened here just now we all won, which is obviously very cheesy, very sitcom here, and that's intentional, you know? There is a certain level of artifice to these women, and they, like Sarah, are not immune to falling back on cliches, but that doesn't mean that their genuine emotions aren't real. Are they a bunch of Broadway listening fancy napkin buying lemon square baking suburban soccer mom with all the baggage that implies? Yes, but they are also more than that. One does not cancel out the other, and they're still human beings worthy of understanding and respect. My earlier drafts really leaned into Sarah's misogyny, and were sort of poking fun at the suburban women, which isn't the point of the story. Like, listen, Karens are funny, I get that. It's really more interesting examining where misogyny comes from than, you know, what women are targeted by misogyny, because the answer is all of them in different ways, in different times, by different people. I wanted to make it very clear with future editions of the story that it wasn't just about a not like other girls girl getting one over on the popular meme. Sarah refuses to take part in this emotional moment. She demands to be judged for her lemon squares, which makes the other women angry at her, start to call her a freak. Karen is very self-satisfied and Sarah is annoyed, but she doesn't get angry until Susan intervenes on her behalf. So why is it Susan's kindness that angers Sarah? Because that's what challenges her worldview. She expects women to be bitches like Karen, but she doesn't expect them to stand up for her in any meaningful way. Also, the way Susan stands up for her obviously upsets her because it implies that she needs to be stood up for, that she needs protection, as Sarah says herself, as if there was anything wrong with how I was made, how my husband made me. It's not just an attack on her and her way of life, it's an attack on her husband, and she cannot tolerate that. So Sarah has finally reached her breaking point. She is going to win this Lemon Square Bake Off no matter what. She rips the foil off and unleashes chaos. And she tells the officer, no, I did not know it would kill them, but I am not sorry it did. I definitely wanted to include a line like this in Sarah's confession to make it clear that for all the planning that went into making the lemon square, she wasn't actively trying to kill anybody. And this wasn't so much to exonerate Sarah in the eyes of the reader, because I mean, she doesn't feel any remorse. Like, she might not have meant to kill them, but like she said, she's not sorry. She is a killer at heart, honestly. This functions more as setup for the novelization, which, like I've said before, deals with Sarah's trials. The question of intent in legal procedures is very important, so seeing whether or not Sarah uh, meant to kill these women, that is something that's going to be discussed more and more in the novelization. So then we have the passage describing the eldritch, Lovecraftian, bizarre lemon square weirdness going on, and people's flesh are melting off, and the sky is changing colors like an oil slick and all of this. This was one of the hardest passages to rewrite because I really wanted to keep the choppiness of Sarah's writing intact, and it was really hard for me because it's pretty much the opposite from how I normally write, which I prefer really long sentences, really in-depth descriptions. So forcing myself to stick in the confines of Sarah's voice, you know, much like Sarah herself sticks in the confines of her programming, you know, it was a challenge, especially in a scene like this where everything's going wild and it's tempting to want to do the same with the language and really explode and run with it. But I had to keep it contained because Sarah wouldn't do that. The closest Sarah gets to any kind of like catharsis and like breaking loose is when she starts to question her relationship with her husband, which we are going to discuss in a little bit. But first I want to talk about Sarah describing the women's death, saying the electric fence of skin turned off, the mind free to wander, to want, 
it might have been like meeting God or becoming one. This is the first time we see Sarah really contemplate what it's like to die, not just the fact of mortality. And it's an exercise of empathy not directed at Jamie or her husband, which makes this really exceptional. Something else that's exceptional for Sarah is, like I said, when she starts questioning her relationship to her husband. Literal dimensions are opening up before her, and they're also opening up in her mind, and she's able to recognize that her husband was one of them, a human. She realizes what she's done and the futility of it. She recognizes that she doesn't really care about those women and wishes she was unleashing violence on her husband instead, but is still, even with everything falling apart around her, is unable to admit that. So she can only make a start at questioning what this means. We see that questioning most directly at the end of her knock-knock joke. Why do I hate those women? Why do I love my husband? This is contrasted, of course, with her talking about Jamie and saying, there was no why when I thought of my daughter. This line and this whole passage about Jamie at the end, this wasn't added until the contest revisions, which is wild to me. Anyway, it made me think of the introduction to Speaker for the Dead by Orson Scott Card, where he talks about how Novena's several children were originally sort of a non-presence in the novel, and he was challenged to really incorporate them into the story, and that caused the story to take the shape that it does. That's how I feel about this sentence. There is no why when I thought of my daughter. In earlier drafts, Sarah was defined by her hatred for other women. Now Sarah is defined by her ability to love her child. And it's heartbreaking that Sarah does have this love when she says, yes, I know, because the implication is that she knows that Jamie would not come running for her because she's already lost the mother that she loved and she doesn't love Sarah. Previously, I ended this story with everyone's flesh melting off, the colors changing, everything, and Sarah just contentedly musing over her victory. And I like this ending a lot more with, tell me I will see her again, officer please, because it shows that Sarah is not empowered by this violence. She is still trapped within the system, still desperately appealing to authority to try and get the one thing of meaning in her life, which is the ability to connect with her daughter. You can see that even the genuine love that she has is stymied by the system around her. It's heartbreaking because you can imagine that like no one in their right mind is ever going to let Sarah near Jamie again, but Sarah still has this futile hope like she has throughout the story. However, if you're wondering if Sarah ever will see see Jamie again, you will have to check out the novelization when that comes out. Don't know when that will be, because I still have to finish writing it. But until then, I will just leave you with some lemon ASMR. You want to know my tips for writing an award-winning story? That's it right there. No, but really, I think the most important thing to keep in mind when writing a short story for any sort of context is to keep track of the momentum of the story. What are you doing in every sentence that is pulling the reader forward? Where are you losing them? You know, think about it. If you were just picking up the story randomly, what would make you stop reading it? Find those moments and think about how you can work around them. You're not going to catch every possible objection every possible person could have to your story, nor should you try to correct them all. But if you keep asking yourself those questions and trying to answer them as best you can, it will lead to a better developed story. It will lead you to thinking about your pacing very conscientiously. And who knows, you might get an honorable mention at the Sci-Fi Writers of the Future contest. And who knows, no one's watching this video anyway. But if you are, and if you've made it here, thank you very much. I have been Solar de Santa Ella. And if, and if you want to hear more readings and commentaries and video essays, I swear to God I'm going to do another video essay. Maybe the John Green one, maybe something else. We'll see. Definitely going to talk about Ender's Game at some point, but I need to rally my strength for that. In any case, I hope you enjoy a delicious lemon square that doesn't melt your flesh off, and I hope you have great luck in your writing endeavors.